So I'm going to, you've just had your entire cerebrum filled with research data and what's to be in the future. I want to pull you back into the present. I'm primarily a clinician and a researcher secondarily. And so what I'm going to talk about is really a grassroots down in the office. How do I actually make these distinctions? So again, these are my disclosures. If you're a recognized expert, you work with a lot of people, and I'm happy to have support from anybody who wants to further the cause of psychiatry. Interesting to note, I work with the NFL. So if you're a NFL player and have ADHD, you need a therapeutic use exemption to be on stimulant medications. In order to get that, you need to be evaluated by one of only 40 designated people in the United States in order to get that therapeutic use exemption. So I work, I work with professional athletes who have ADHD. The objectives here, I'm gonna teach you how to do a diagnostic interview that can help distinguish between ADHD and bipolar disorder. I'm also gonna teach you about emotional dysregulation as an overlapping and not distinguishing symptom of ADHD and bipolar disorder. Understand diagnostic prioritization. If you have a patient with three or four psychiatric concurrent disorders, how do you treat one without making the second, third, and fourth worse? And also, what's the research on using stimulants in bipolar patients and ADHD? Now, Roger, Roger gave away my, uh, my punchline, so I can show you one slide and then sit down and you'll all be relieved. This is my favorite slide. So I'm in Baltimore on the Chesapeake Bay. And you're gonna remember this slide because there's a clinical note to this. And that is, I will rhetorically ask you, what's the diagnosis? Did this man have psychotic mania believing he was James Bond and the truck would turn into a submarine? Does he have ADHD and got distracted by the bikini walking by on the beach? Does he have a lousy GPS system that thought there was a road there? <laughs> or does he have executive dysfunction and couldn't figure out which end goes in first? <laughs> so the point, as, as funny as the, as the slide is, the point here is that your diagnostic accuracy as a snapshot in time or a symptom checklist is going to be less specific and sensitive than if you look at the longitudinal course, the age of onset, and family psychiatric history all three of which are not part of diagnostic criteria. So if the distinction was as simple as this, this would be the single slide. I'd go to conclusions and we'd all go home. But it's not. We all know that ADHD starts in childhood and that bipolar disorder, although can exist in childhood, often has its index onset in late adolescence and early adulthood. Bipolar disorder is much more mood-based, whereas ADHD is much more cognitive-based. Although with the overlap now, as you hear more and more discussion about cognitive disturbance and mood disorders, you can't figure out is this a residual cognitive symptom from a mood disorder or is this an ADHD? And then the clinical course is bipolar tends to be episodic and ADHD is chronic and relatively unchanging. And, and this is very concrete differentiation, but this is not what happens in your clinical interview because there's so much noise in the clinical interview, it's hard to make these distinctions unless you have a structured outline as to how you're separating out symptoms and longitudinal course. Just to look at prevalence of ADHD and bipolar disorder. So ADHD, Prevalence for children, this is in the United States, is about 8%. I'm actually undercutting this. The CDC has moved this up to 10 or 11%, but it's a, a data methodology issue. But let's go with 8% for children in the US, 4.4% of adults in the US. If you look at bipolar disorder then, in children it's about 0.5%, and in adults it's about 2.5%. So one thing that you don't see on this slide, uh, you don't conclude quickly, and often I'll present slides. I'll tell you what you see, I'll tell you what it means, then I'll tell you what you don't see, and then I'll tell you how you need to reinterpret what you had originally thought was the conclusion of the slide. And if you look at this, 
you'll notice that ADHD in adults, 4.4%, is higher than bipolar disorder. And yet, in most psychiatric residency programs, you get about one lecture on adult ADHD, unless you're in a major center that has a specific program addressing the ADHD adult population. So you have a psychiatric disorder that's second only to major depression and prevalence, and yet nobody gets formally trained on this. Well, you can't identify what you don't know. And if you don't know, then you reassign those symptoms to cognition of mood disorders, cognition of schizophrenia, uh, substance abuse, or just PIA patients under the access to, formerly access to categories. I should speed up. So mood disorders in children, about 4% for the ADHD population. And then when you move into the adults, it becomes higher. But Bob Findling, who is at Hopkins, has written a lot on bipolar disorder in children. He's the chair for child psychiatry at Hopkins. And the difficulty in looking at the children is, are you looking at impulsive reactive aggression from ADHD? Are you looking from, at disruptive mood dysregulation? Or are you looking at bipolar disorder? And the patients don't come in with their diagnosis tattooed on their forehead. So you're just seeing emotional noise and you have to figure out what that's all about. In adults, if you run an adult ADHD clinic, the comorbidity for mood disorders is about 40%. So in adult ADHD, one of four or five are gonna have bipolar disorder or major depression. And the rule of thumb is, after you make a diagnosis of adult ADHD and you break your arm, pat yourself on the back, you need to stop and then reassess for all of the other psychiatric conditions because you're going to go finding at least two, if not three or four other psychiatric disorders. But you don't run an adult ADHD center. You run a mood disorder center. So if you look at it from that orientation, for major depressive patients, about one in 10 major depressed patients are going to have adult ADHD. And it's not adult onset ADHD, it's adults with ADHD who had symptoms since childhood that have been chronic, pervasive, and impairing ever since. Bipolar disorder, again, these are not overlapping symptoms. This is not diagnostic confusion because of overlap. These studies specifically separated these out and made clear clinical diagnoses. Now, if you don't look at it from the adult ADHD population, but you look at it from the bipolar disorder population. This is the STEP study that was done uh, in the US, which is the very large bipolar study. And if you look at the 1,000 of the people with comorbid adult ADHD, about 9% of the bipolar patients had ADHD in this study. So this is looking at a bipolar population. And, and methodologically, you have to think about what populations are you looking at? Are you looking at the adult ADHD population and then coming the comorbidities? Or are you looking at the bipolar population and then coming at the comorbidities? Because the, the, the numbers change. But as one of my mentors said, don't let, a, don't let a speaker make an important point on one study. So we always like to present a um, an alternative study, and this is a Turkish study that looks at the same thing. They get prevalence rates of about 16%. So these numbers have a range, but you get the idea that if you have adult ADHD or you have bipolar disorder, it's about a 20% chance that you have the other condition simultaneously. So there are two, there are two concepts here that I'm going to introduce. One is historically we've always thought that hallucinations and delusions were psychotic illness, part of schizophrenia, and yet we've come to understand that psychosis doesn't make the diagnostic distinction. Executive function has to do with response inhibition, that's impulse control, working memory, holding information in your head, set shifting, the ability to move smoothly from task to task and flexibly direct your attention where it's necessary, and interference control, which is resisting distractions. There's two camps. One camp says executive function is subsumed under ADHD, and the other camp says executive function is categorically different, operationally defined by neuropsychological testing. If you do it by neuropsychological testing, about 30 to 40%, 30 to 50% of ADHD have executive dysfunction. 
And you know this in patients because when you treat them with stimulants, you may have a group that clean up very well and they're organized and they can plan, and you have another group that's not distracted, they can attend, they can sustain attention, but they can't sequence, they can't task shift, and they remain disorganized. So coming back to the psychotic differentiation, we had assumed that emotional regulation was subsumed under bipolar disorder and executive dysfunction was subsumed under ADHD, and that's simply not true. We know emotional dysregulation is part of ADHD, although not part of the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, and executive function now is um, part of a broad range of both neurologic, medical, and psychiatric disorders. So, the point of the slide is you can't use emotional dysregulation or executive function as a distinguishing factor to make the diagnosis between ADHD and bipolar disorder. So as I mentioned, executive function uh, extends broadly to a number of medical illnesses. And Roger has not alluded to it, specifically stated, cognition is an, is an outcome and disturbed by a variety of uh, psychiatric and medical processes. So just to present a little bit, and not that the specific tasks are important, but the point of this slide is that bipolar patients have poor performance on immediate verbal memory tasks, and that both ADHD and bipolar disorder exhibited significant lower scores than controls on recognition phase of verbal and nonverbal memory tasks, as well as tasks of executive function with high working memory demands. You're seeing deficits equally in ADHD, bipolar disorder, so those deficits can't be the diagnostic distinguishers to help you. And noticeably, ADHD had significantly better performance than bipolar patients on recognition phase of the Ray list memory task and the Ray figure. That's a complex figure they have to memorize and then replicate. <coughs> so if you can't use executive dysfunction as a distinguishing factor between ADHD and bipolar disorder, can you use emotional liability as a distinguishing factor? Well, the, the short answer to that is you can't. So here's the overlapping symptoms. For bipolar patients, manic or hypomanic have to do with increased talkativeness, racing thoughts, distractibility, psychomotor agitation, and increased risky behavior. You can change the lexicon of the descriptive of the behavior, but when you're sitting in your office and you're looking at the behavior, the lexicon doesn't help you make the diagnostic distinction. And so the bipolar symptoms can also be described in ADHD as talks too much, hypertalkativeness, difficulty maintaining attention, distractibility, fidgety and restless, psychomotor agitation, increased risky behavior, impulsivity. It's the same behavior using a different vocabulary as if that vocabulary will help you make the diagnostic distinction. It, it doesn't. And then you have the impairments, which are in both bipolar and ADHD. So again, just to highlight and drive this point home, here's two columns. One column is bipolar disorder. These are descriptors written by bipolar experts in the scientific literature. And the other is written by Russell Barkley, who's an internationally recognized ADHD guru. Bipolar are hyper-responsive, and ADHD have inhibitory deficits of emotional reacti reactivity. This is like the attorneys who get trained how to argue both sides of the coin and it's the same coin. And you can see as you walk down, and I won't read all of these for the sake of time, that the descriptors here are describing the same behavior that you wouldn't be able to distinguish in your practice diagnostically. So I'm leaving you with this conundrum because then you start saying, well, look, Dr. Goodman, how am I even gonna make this distinction? And if you're telling me I can't make this distinction, then, then how am I going to? Because this is a worthless talk. You're depressing the heck out of me. So looking at emotional dysregulation further. So I'm gonna look at research over the course of children, adolescents, and adults and show you. This is in children, large study, 500, 100 irritable kids and 400 non-irritable kids. And if you look at the diagnoses that these folks get, the irritable kids are more likely to be diagnosed with affective disorders, more likely to be diagnosed with ODD, and more and less likely 
to get uh, no psychiatric comorbidity. What happens to the emotional uh, dysregulation as these folks age? This is both children and adults. The people who have persistent ADHD have persistent emotional dysregulation. The people whose ADHD remit to some significant degree also find that their emotional dysregulation remits as well. This is in adults. 150 adults with ADHD, 335 with bipolar disorder, and they were assessed on two scales. One is affective liability scale, and the other is an affect intensity measure. It's a retrospective Swiss study. Using the two self-reports, adult ADHD patients displayed emotional dysregulation with a higher mood liability and responsiveness similar to bipolar patients in comparison to controls. ADHD subjects essentially differ from bipolar subjects on perceived emotional intensity, but not on emotional instability. The severity of ADHD was strongly correlated to both the emotional response and liability. So the worse your ADHD symptoms, the more likely the greater severity of emotion dysregulation. And again, you have this patient sitting in your office without the diagnosis tattooed on their forehead. How, how do you make make the differentiation. But beyond this, why is emotional dysregulation problematic? If you think about ADHD and the impairments it causes, you get performance impairments, you get social impairments. If you have, if you have executive dysfunction, those performance impairments are going to be worse. And if you have emotional dysregulation, your social impairments are going to be worse. This is shown also by Joe Biederman in children. That is children with ADHD versus children with ADHD and executive dysfunction. The kids with ADHD and executive dysfunction performed academically uh, worse than kids just with ADHD. So it's not ADHD to impairments. It's ADHD executive function impairments, ADHD dysregul emotional dysregulation impairments. This is uh, 1,500 kids looking at the impact of emotional problems. ADHD with emotional dysregulation were significantly more impaired in peer relations, family life, academic performance, occupational attainment, and, controlling for, and that was controlling for other comorbidities. This is another study, and the conclusion was our findings indicate that emotional inflexibility and a slow return to emotional baseline a low threshold for emotional excitability in patients and socially inappropriate behavior and difficulty in behavioral control when experiencing negative emotions are exhibited by young adolescents with ADHD, and these elements of emotion dysregulation are associated with social impairment. That's a long sentence, and that's why academics have editors. So treatment, this is in pediatrics, actually, um, adolescents. So they looked at acute manic response with and without ADHD. There were 42 patients, adolescents, who were hospitalized for acute mania, and then they were discharged either on lithium or divalproex. Di this is mixed mania, about 85% and those with ADHD, about 34%. The findings here, reduced global response with lithium and dalvoprox for ADHD bipolar versus bipolar patients. So if you have ADHD and bipolar disorder, you're less likely to respond to the mood stabilizer than if you have bipolar disorder alone. It is likely that in the majority of ADHD bipolar patients, the treatment of bipolar disorder alone may result in residual symptoms such as difficulty in attention, concentration, planning, at least in part, and may explain the impairment of functioning frequently observed during euthymic periods. Okay, I get it, self-evident. Here's the problem. If you believe that cognitive symptoms are the function of residual, AD, of, of residual bipolar disorder, that is insufficiently treated, you will have missed the opportunity to treat the underlying ADHD. 
And you won't know that the residual cognitive impairments are from ADHD if you never assessed for ADHD at the initial evaluation. So Roger and I go back on this. We, we like each other, we're big friends, but we sometimes have debates on how are we gonna to convey to clinicians how you sort out cognitive impairment as a result of which psychiatric disorder, because the determination there speaks to your pharmacologic and psychotherapeutic treatment. This is amphetamines in children. This is an open label, and I agree with Roger. Every open label is positive until proven otherwise. It's 40 ADHD bipolar subjects. The bipolar one to two is a ratio of three to one. And these folks were stabilized, their mania was stabilized by Valprox on monotherapy. Of the 40 subjects then, 80% achieved a 50% reduction in the mania scale. Only three had significant improvement in ADHD symptoms. Now that simply may have been the cognitive improvement from their stabilized mania. But 30 subjects go on then, they're stabilized from their mania. They go on in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial with mixed amphetamine salts, low dose, five milligrams BID. They do it for two weeks and then they do a crossover design. Of the 30 subjects, mixed amphetamine salts was significantly more effective for ADHD symptoms than placebo. 90% had a one to two point improvement in their global cognitive improvement score. So I published a paper years ago looking at a pediatric and an adult trial. And the question for the study was, what is the correlation between the improvement in the ADHD rating scale and a CGI, clinical global improvement uh, scale? So the global improvement is scored on a seven point it's mild, moderate improvement or, or decline. In ADHD, you get efficacy and approval by a 30% reduction in ADHD symptoms. In depression, you get approval with a 50% reduction. So they set the threshold in adult ADHD on the low end from my uh, perspective. So a 30% reduction in ADHD symptoms translates into one point on a CGI. That's mild clinical improvement almost not even clinically discernible. You need at least a two-point change on your CGI in research to show a clinically significant improvement. So I, I add this information so that you understand that in this trial, there was a clinically significant observable improvement in this person's ADHD symptoms, even while they were mood stabilized on their valproate and there were no significant side effects or worsening of mania over eight weeks. But if you're a clinician, you say, okay, I appreciate that, but eight weeks is hardly long enough to discern the risk of, of mania induction when adding stimulant medication. So keep that in mind. So they continued the study. Um, no, this is a, another study. So what's that? No, same study. 12-week follow-up open label, 23 patients now on Depakote and mixed amphetamine salts. The Depakote dose was not changed. Average dose was 750 milligrams with a level of 82 micrograms. And mixed amphetamine salts were adjusted in about half the patients up to a mean dose of 15 milligrams a day. Only one subject had mania induced over the course of 12 weeks. So you have an eight week trial and then a 12 week trial, so you have 20 weeks there. Methylphenidate treatment for ADHD in bipolar youths. This is again, ADHD and bipolar disorder. Instead of looking at amphetamines, we're looking at methylphenidate here. Four week double blind placebo control, methylphenidate in use with ADHD comorbid bipolar disorder. Small study, 16 subjects completed. Children ages 10, they were treated with a mood stabilizer, either valproate or lithium, and had persistent ADHD symptoms. This is Dr. Findling's study, and if you know Bob Findling, which many of you probably do not, um, he creates a lot of complexity in his research, so these subjects were assigned to six possible dosing orders. But at the end of the study, and before the blind was broken, 
that put the subjects on the best dose week and looked at ADHD rating scale as rated by the parent. There was a significant reduction in the parent's rating of ADHD. Remember, these are bipolar children, stabilized, put on methylphenidate. The effect size of improvement of their ADHD was 0.9. There was no change in the mania scale, and the CGI significantly lowered, suggesting less psychopathology. Amphetamines in ADHD and bipolar patients. So by this time, you're going, okay, we're running through one study after another study after another study, and I'm getting kind of bored. And that's fine. My purpose here is to show you so that you leave this lecture realizing that there is a body of literature that strongly suggests that if you have ADHD and bipolar disorder and you stabilize the bipolar disorder, you can actually use stimulant medications prudently, effectively to treat the residual ADHD. So this is amphetamines in bipolar adult ADHD four-week flexible dose open label. This was Roger's study that he presented, so I'll walk through this quickly. Lizdex amphetamine, stable bipolar disorder and ADHD. There were 40 patients. Lizdex was started at 30 and then moved up to a max of 70. No subjects discontinued because of induction of hypomania or psychotic symptoms. And there was a significant improvement in baseline to endpoint in quality of life measures. This is another study Roger presented as well. This is the risk of mania with methylphenidate. So this is a Swedish study, large study, 2,300 bipolar patients were put on methylphenidate with or without mood stabilizers. They had been hospitalized for mania and stabilized. And then the measure here was whether they were re-hospitalized or whether their uh, bipolar medicine was adjusted. They were looked at three months and then three to six months. So this is a fairly long follow-up. And this is data presented just differently. You're looking at hazard ratios. So methylphenidate without a mood stabilizer, your hazard ratio within the first three months of a manic episode was 6.7. And at six months, it was the same. If you were mood stabilized and put on methylphenidate, your hazard ratio was 0.6. And at six months, it was the same. This is very impressive. So when you talk to your colleagues and everybody says, at least the, the mood disorder people who haven't read the ADHD literature said, don't touch my bipolar patients with stimulant medications, you'll make them worse. I've given you a slide deck now and you can pull this literature and have a respectful discussion with somebody who fell asleep 40 years ago and like Whip Van Winkle just woke up. So we talked about uh, can stimulants induce mania in risk patients, but what effect do stimulants have on emotional dysregulation by itself in ADHD patients? So this is 41 adults with ADHD who were placed on methylphenidate extended release. Improvement noted in emotional symptoms was significantly correlated with response to attention, distractibility, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. So if the cognitive symptoms and the hyperactivity impulsive symptoms get better, it's likely you're going to see concomitant improvement in emotion dysregulation. It was a six-week follow-up, and the, um, the outcomes were the same. It was maintained. So the improvement in the core cognitive symptoms, the ADHD, uh, the impulsivity, also with emotion dysregulation. And if you, if you see these patients like this and you talk to them, you'll ask them, well, how's your attention, how's your concentration, your sustained focus, uh, initiative, motivation. But then they'll tell you things like, I feel calmer. And you'll assume that calmness means, well, they're less fidgety, they're less restless. When they say they feel calmer, ask, ask it this way. Say, is that a physical experience? Is that an emotional experience? Or is that a mental experience for this reason? If it's a physical experience, they can sit for longer periods of time and feel comfortable. That's fidgetiness and restlessness. If it's mental calmness, the thoughts aren't going through their head so quickly. If it's emotional calmness, it's they have more emotional resilience and they're less reactive. That allows you to better phenomenologically discern what they mean 
by the use of the term. So patients use psychological terms descriptively, not diagnostically. And it's our job as clinicians to refine what the psychological experience is. And the only way you can do that is by asking questions that look at the phenomenologic experience that they're having. So this is methylphenidate in ADHD, looking at emotion dysregulation. It's a multi-site, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, 20-week, long study with a lot of patients, 360 adults, put on extended-release methylphenidate. Methylphenidate was significantly more effective than placebo in treating emotion symptoms. This study is particularly important for the large number of, of patients and also the long duration of action. This idea that if you add stimulants to people who are kind of fidgety, restless, and anxious, and it makes them worse, it just doesn't bear out when you do the research. So having confidently said you can consider using stimulants in your bipolar ADHD patients, let's not be cavalier about this. There are, there are risks. And so Ross, in his paper, reviewed the existing literature in 60 cases. But his conclusion here was it's been estimated that the Toxicosis-related events are infrequent in children in therapeutic doses with an estimated prevalence of a quarter percent. This is in children. These events are usually brief and dose-dependent and resolve in two to seven days. Among the 60 cases described, only five developed a chronic mood disorder or psychotic disorder. I don't know if that's the function of the medication or whether that's a function of an underlying psychiatric diathesis that just erupted as a result. Having said that, this is in children. Then there's another study looking at meta-analysis of 49 studies. I mean, these are large meta-analyses. And the accumulated incidence of psychosis or mania was one and a half per hundred person years with a number needed to harm of 526, a huge. On the other hand, many authors reported manic switches or psychosis now, I've had patients who got psychotic on stimulants. I absolutely have no doubt. They weren't bipolar. They just got psychotic. And here's what they experienced. They grow increasingly paranoid very slowly. So it starts sounding like there's legitimacy to the content. Then the content expands to include people that might not otherwise be. Then it expands to clearly people who have nothing to do with the patient. And you'll see this develop over the course of weeks or months. If you stop the stimulant then, that will not resolve in a week or two. It takes time to, to come back down. And working with a patient like that psychotherapeutically is a real challenge because you have to work with their paranoia and, and keep them involved in treatment, which is often difficult with paranoid people because if you're paranoid, it's not you, it's everybody else. So be vigilant about that as well. What about using atomoxetine for emotion dysregulation? This is a post hoc analysis, two randomized placebo control adults. Uh, in all my slides, ED does not mean erectile dysfunction. You've, you've come to that conclusion. So looking at these folks, those who had emotion dysregulation had more severe ADHD symptoms, they had greater global impairment, and they had a num higher number of anxiety and depressive symptoms as well. And so the symptom overlap continues. Are you looking at emotion dysregulation from ADHD, which is a diagnostic conclusion, or are you looking at anxiety, uh, depression, and irritability, which is a descriptor of their mood state? In the study, the ADHD patients with emotion dysregulation displayed significant improvement with atomoxetine for emotional symptoms as well as their hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. Atomoxetine, again, this is another study. 12-week waiting list, 64 adults, age 36, atomoxetine up to 80 milligrams a day. They had a 60% response on CARS versus 0% for the waiting list. So atomoxetine works for ADHD. 35 to 40% reduction in emotion dysregulation. About 70% of atomoxetine treated patients with res uh, were responders to the treatment with an effect size of one to two, which is fairly high. I think this is a statistic. Statistical error, Ooh, sorry, a statistical issue. Uh, I don't think the effect size are that high. And that's because another study by Phil Asherson in the UK, again, this is a pooled analysis with the data, placebo controlled trials up to 12 weeks, atomoxetine in adults with ADHD. 
They met criteria, DSM-4, and they did not have any history of bipolar disorder. And atomoxetine was effective in this meta-analysis with a effect size of about 0.2, but if the if you separate out those with high levels of emotion dysregulation, the effect size was higher. So amphetamines, methylphenidate, atomoxetine, all used for ADHD, all can be helpful in reducing emotion dysregulation. So the conclusions here on the medications, stimulants may improve ADHD symptoms as well as emotion dysregulation when they're by themselves. Stimulants may also improve the ADHD symptoms in patients who have stable bipolar disorder. There's a low risk of mania or psychosis in stabilized bipolar disorders, but the risk is not absent. So here's the, here's the diagnostic and clinical issue for you. If you conclude the patient has ADHD and you've abbreviated your evaluation and you, haven't con you have not investigated whether they have bipolar disorder, and you put them on ADHD medication, you run the risk that you're gonna provoke a manic episode. So if you have somebody with ADHD, you wanna make sure that when you review your history, you go through whether or not they've had depressive episodes, hypomanic episodes, or manic episodes. Remember, the first index episode of bipolar disorder is more often depression than anything else. And so Roger probably can speak to this. I think the, the studies would say, suggest that about 30 to 40% of first index depression in adolescence walks on to become bipolar disorder. So you want to assess. And this is the issue, and I'll digress for a moment. Years ago, I had this discussion with my colleagues uh, in the ADHD world, uh, many of whom were uh, child psychiatrist. So child psychiatrist has moved and followed the ADHD arena and they've moved into the adult arena. But I'm an adult psychiatrist and the perspective is a bit different because the comor comorbidity rates are higher in adults than they are in the children or they're at least different. And so we used to have discussions because they would say treat the most impairing disorder first and then see how the dust settles out. You can't do that in adult psychiatry because if you have a quiescent bipolar patient and you treat the ADHD and a month later they come back and they're psychotic, you, you miss the diagnosis of bipolar disorder or an underlying uh, psychotic diathesis that erupted as a result. So you really need to do a full comprehensive psychiatric evaluation to rule out all of the other psychiatric comorbidities before you start touching these people with, with stimulant medications. And stimulants alone um, don't, re don't reduce emotional dysregulation. Atomoxetine does it equally well. So you have a complex patient. They binge drink on the weekend, they have bipolar disorder, they have panic attacks, they have ADHD. How do, you how do you decide which you treat first, second, and third? So that has to do with diag diagnostic prioritization. So you treat the severe alcohol and substance abuse first, you treat the severe mood disorder second, you treat the severe anxiety disorders third, you treat ADHD last. So I wrote about this 15 years ago. And why is, it, why is it formulated this way? Because the cognitive symptoms you see in ADHD can also be produced in the aforementioned diagnoses. Also, the medication that you use in ADHD can make the aforementioned diagnoses worse. So this is how you walk through the algorithm. Now, it's not carved in stone. If I have somebody who has uh, moderate anxiety and ADHD, I'm gonna treat the ADHD because I think the anxiety is going to reduce with the treatment of the, of the ADHD. If I have somebody with a mild depressive disorder, I treat the ADHD first, and then I see what happens to the depressive disorder. How do you make the distinction between primary anxiety and anxiety as an outgrowth of ADHD? So here's a little clinical nugget on the interview. If you ask patients what they're anxious about and they tell you they worry about performance-based issues, it's likely that it's secondary to the ADHD. So they worry about forgetting. They worry about completing. They worry about getting someplace. They worry about doing their homework. That's performance-based. That probably is secondary to the ADHD. If they say they worry about catching germs, if they worry about somebody dying, if they worry because my clothes aren't lined up in the right order, that probably is a primary anxiety disorder. 
And in making that distinction, you'll then know what elements of the anxiety get better and what elements of the anxiety get worse. Because you can have somebody with ADHD and OCD. Their ADHD gets better, their secondary anxiety gets better, they're still ritualistic. For that, you'd need to address with an SSRI or some other um, agent. So those are some clinical pearls on, on clinical interviewing techniques in order to sort these things out. And, and those clinical pearls, I find, don't come through in the research. You, you cannot get this kind of um, information in research studies. It really is someone who's been doing it for 30, 33 years. And so I wrote about this 15 years ago, and then the Italian researchers confirmed this for me and said, in our clinical experience, consistently with other authors, patients with ADHD and bipolar disorder should have their bipolar disorder treated first based on the current level of information. We do not recommend treatment of comorbid ADHD bipolar with ADHD medications in the absence of mood stabilizers. And so here is the conclusion. ADHD and bipolar disorder are categorically different disorders. Roger and I debated another colleague at the APA two years ago about, he thought he was a bipolar expert and believed that ADHD was really uh, an outgrowth of bipolar disorder and we were on, the, I was on the ADHD side and Roger kind of negotiated between the two of us as, as he does because he was the larger of the two of us. Um, there are non-DSM-5 factors to increase the accuracy of your diagnosis. So longitudinal course, age of onset, family psychiatric history. ADHD is highly genetic. 75% of the cause is genetic. If I have somebody who presents with ADHD and I know that there's a first-degree family re relative that was diagnosed or clearly sounds descriptively like they have ADHD, this person probably has ADHD. Executive function and emotional dysregulation may be distractors to diagnostic accuracy. And that, although having listened to this lecture, you would say, well, you know, okay, that's, that makes a lot of sense. That would be heresy in a lot of lectures with other uh, academic psychiatrists. Diagnostic prioritization helps develop your pharmacologic algorithm, and stimulants may be used thoughtfully in bipolar stabilized patients who have ADHD. And so with that, I'll stop, take questions, and Roger, I'll moderate.